Fuck kill, spread death, and destruction as they destroy. And we still do as we are told. Well, they make laws and pass bills, brainwashed by everything around us. All we see, perhaps they might get you. But for sure they're aiming at me They buy here cause it's the cheapest Because we abuse our labor Keep them part time Working 40 plus a week No health insurance And it gets better We can buy in bulk from China Make two dollars off for every penny Spent in sweatshops This is a extraordinary event And I'm very proud to be part of this In commemoration of the 50th anniversary Of the coup in Chile a way of getting the word out, educating fellow workers, and educating the U.S. public. The presentation I'm going to make, which I have some notes that are prepared as best as I could, uh, is going to be largely based on a book um, on the subject of Mexico. Um, the book was written by a fellow UAW member, auto worker, by the name of Rob McKenzie. And by coincidence or not, it's also the title of the book is The Coup, El Golpe. Uh, it comes at a time uh, where this, uh, it's a subject where the UAW members and leaders, uh, and uh, as a UAW organizer myself, I'm a uh, former local leader of the local 909 UAW in Warren, Michigan. And it was also served on the UAW staff in the GN department. And I also speak as the brother of Mike Hammer, who was an operative in the American Institute for Free Labor Development, and who was assassinated in El Salvador in 1981. He's also the subject of the book by Rob McKenzie, in his fourth chapter on El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And currently, uh, I'm actually speaking as an international uh, solidarity activist, collaborating with GM workers in Colombia, in Mexico, in Germany. And I'm working in tandem with the reform group in the UAW it goes by the name of Unite All Workers for Democracy, UAWD. My intent is to reach out to UAW members, especially, who are part of this rising movement in the, UA, in the UAW, who are transforming the UAW through a one member, one vote initiative a year ago, and who won many positions in the national leadership who are fighting for a more aggressive and militant UAW. And that UAW right now, within a matter of a few days, is potentially going to be going out on strike at Ford, GM, and Chrysler, or Stellantis. So it's a particularly intense moment for rank and file UAW members. And it's clear from the new leadership, and especially the rank and file, that they see the importance of international solidarity, some specifically, some more abstractly. So it's timely because the Chrysler Corporation, or Solantis, just recently issued a threat in response to the UAW's aggressive demands that if the UAW uh, presses on these demands, that Chrysler will move its operations for a truck plant to Mexico. So that the timing couldn't be more robust. Mackenzie's book is timely because it illuminates Mexican auto workers and their and their their version, Mexican workers' version of what we may be familiar with with the Flint sit-down strikes in GM in 1937. But this struggle in Mexico is very little known. It included an occupation of a Ford plant in 1990, which led to the armed, an armed conflict with 300 hired goons who stormed the factory, shooting nine workers and killing one, Cleto Nigmo Urbina. 
He was murdered on January 8th. And it is the intent of Lepayo to commemorate this brother's untimely death by going to Mexico and commemorating him with our brothers and sisters from the Ford plant and generally in the workers' movement in Mexico. That struggle that uh, Clayto was part of included the 38-day hunger strike by two of the workers. It included an occupation of the factory. It was very militant. But it didn't make it into the pages of the UAW's so-called Solidarity magazine. And the reason was simple. The UAW, with the exception of two UAW locals, Rob McKenzie's local, 879 in St. Paul, Minnesota, and another local, locally in the suburbs of Detroit, local 900, with their exceptions, the UAW was, in fact, on the wrong side. The new breed of the rank and file leaders that are emerging and looking for a more aggressive UAW can, can't possibly rebuild the UAW after years of uh, corruption scandals without understanding the history of the Mexican worker struggle at the Ford plant. Although the story made it into progressive journals, like for example, Against the Current, they could not contextualize that struggle to include the players we needed to understand the most. And that was the US State Department, the CIA, the FML CIO, my brother's organization, AFIL, and what was mentioned earlier, the National Endowment for Democracy. They all played a role in the defeat of the Ford workers. So this is the contribution that Rob McKenzie's book makes. He contextualizes that struggle and brings it into the orbit of the US empire. So the struggle at Ford took place in 1990. Three years and well before the NAFTA agreement, the free trade agreement, the most hated free trade agreement between US, Canada and Mexico. By that time, before the NAFTA, GM, Ford, and Chrysler already employed 40,000 workers in Mexico. GM alone had 25 plants there. And in 1980, for example, there was a wave of militancy and there was an, a, a strike at GM that lasted 106 days. This is in Mexico. That unfortunately the workers lost. In 1987, and this will ring a bell for UAW members stateside, Ford was intent on introducing lean production, the Toyota manufacturing system, which is what brought the struggle at Ford to a flashpoint. In the 60s and 70s, CTM actually had a strong, at that plant, had a strong contract contracts that we were familiar with in the 70s with strong job classifications, seniority rights, and more. And these all represented obstacles to Ford that wanted to go into lean production and uh, jointness in Mexico. In 81, the conflict that erupted at Ford, Ford made a unilateral wage cut for new hires and this will also ring a bell with UAW members who today are contending with multi-tiers at, at these companies and are struggling to bring those to an end. The new hires would get 30% less income wages than the current workers. In 87, there was a two and a half month strike. So a lot of struggle in the 80s. In the 80s was a very tur turbulent period. And there was an emergence then of what I would refer to as the amalgamated revolutionary left. One of the groups was the PRT, 
and there were members of the PRT who worked at this plant, and that's very critical to understand. This should be of interest to the UAW reformers, is that the members of this left group were elected to the new local executive committee, and they actually became the leadership of that uh, union, their lo that local union at that fourth plant. All of what I'm talking about was monitored constantly by the CIA. But apparently the CIA was confident, and, and, and not only just talking about the Ford plant, but the CIA generally had reconnaissance over all left activity in Mexico. But the CIA was confident that the dominant political party in Mexico, the PRI, which dominated the unions in Mexico, the CTM, the Confederation of Mexican Workers, that they were able to, in their words, co-opt the left. The CIA was not alone in doing this uh, reconnaissance and oversight. The AFL and the AFIELD were both involved. AFIELD had an office in Mexico City already in 1960s. And there was a lot of travel between that office and Washington, D.C. By 1983, Afield was funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, which was mentioned earlier, which really served as a conduit between the U.S. Congress under Reagan to fund the nefarious activities of Afield in many countries, as has already been mentioned, especially, of course, in Chile, but in Mexico as well. The NED Institute that did this was called the Free Trade Union Institute. An example of how they funded this, the work, and the kind of language that was used uh, was also included in, in, in Mackenzie's book. And it went with sweet words like focusing on civic education as provided by the CTM to strengthen the political action structure of the CTM through the training of grassroots trade union political activists in democracy in Mexico. The CTM, as I mentioned earlier, was an arm of the PRI, of the dominant political party that controlled Mexico for over six decades. The proposed grant actually represented a grant to uh, a subsidy to the PRI through the CTM. In 1985, the Free Trade Union, the Trade Union um, Institute, Free Trade Union Institute, sorry, and AFIEL described their work th this way, quote, to strengthen the ties between the Confederation of Mexican Workers, the CTM, and the AFL CIO. By 1986, the AFIEL office was located in, in the building that was owned by the CTM in downtown Mexico City. Conditions during that period of time in the late 80s were very unstable, and this represented the context for what happened at the Ford Motor Company in 1989. CTM and the FFL-CIO held meetings, as in, in a meeting in 1988 in Brownsville, Texas, and also in uh, Metamoros in, in, in Mexico. These meetings were held in secret as the records of the Information in the National Affairs Department of CFL-CIO and the UAW are not open to the public. Both were there. The attendees included the FFL-CIO Secretary Treasurer, UAW President Owen Bieber, and the representatives of some of the, inter uh, of the International Affairs Department, and of course, the AFIELD Director, William Doherty, who was once my brother's boss, who was also CIA. And the subject of these meetings were the maquilas, the plants that brought in raw parts from the U.S., assembled them, and then returned them back to the U.S. without tariffs. Bieber, it should be noted, was also a member of the board of AFIELD. 
funded by the NED and the CIA. And the AFL CIO and the CTM, as a result of those meetings, issued a joint communique agreeing to form industrial groups cross border. The fact that they had their offices in the same building, the CTM and AFL, meant that there was a constant oversight of what the CTM was doing. It was no surprise to the UAW or to the AFL CIO. So Beaver represented the AFL CIO as the chairman of this committee that was formed in these meetings with a counterpart from the CTM. There were a lot of meetings between the CTM head over the Ford operations and Beaver. And it was during the same time that Beaver was being challenged stateside by the New Directions movement of which I was a part. It was led by Jerry Tucker, including at the 86th and especially at the 89th convention, 80, uh, 1989 convention. It was during the 1990, during 1988 that the newly elected executive committee at the Ford Quatitlan plant were making changes, including undoing the concessions made by the CTM previously, and they followed a new strategy of actively engaging the union members in the process. And again, this is going to resonate with the rank and file movement going on in the UAW. The local began doing previously unheard of things like holding union meetings where the local executive committee listened to the workers. And as a result, the local committee grew in fame and recognition throughout Mexico. There were national elections for the leadership of, this, of the CTM. And in the lead up to that, Ford fired six of the uh, four or six of the executive members that I've just previously described as being part of the PRT. Let me look at my notes here. The fightings there were triggered by CTM and in turn sparked the formation of the Ford Workers Democratic Movement. To help build the movement, the wives of the fired members of that executive committee came to the plant with cookie jars and asking for donations. So you could see that it was a mass movement. It was a movement from below. The majority of the workforce began to support those fired members. By July 1989, two of the fired workers started their hunger strike that I mentioned previously, which lasted 38 days. The conflicts that ensued escalated involving the company uh, CTM and involving the executive committee of the local and a group of other workers in support of that committee. The conflict went, went, included the mysterious disappearances of some of the militant workers. Things got to a head, the, the executive committee of the local had a scheduled meeting with the leadership of the CTM that never took place. Instead of that meeting happening, where the local was wanting to hold the CTM accountable for what had been going on, 300 goons in Ford uniforms came into the plant, armed with clubs, pistols, machine guns, and they were there to squash talk of the massive strike. Ford called the police, sent to the plant on January 8th to go after what they, who they thought were the ringleaders. So the police sent by Ford and the goons paid for by the CTM were, came in to, to, uh, to squash the, the Ford resistance and shot the nine workers that I mentioned previously including Cleto Nigma. Ford has never been held to account for what happened. The CTM, uh, known for its civility and uh, uh, obsequience to foreign employers, would not have entered the employer's factory and shot the workers without knowing that they were going to be covered. And that covered, cover was going to come from the CIA.
The AFL-CIO had developed a close bond with the CTM over three decades of battling communist, socialists, and other allies. And of course, that's what we've been talking today about in regards to Chile. It was done through AFIELD. We would not understand the forward struggle without understanding the role of these all these U.S. players. And we, on January 8th, hope to hold the AFL accountable for what happened, the UAW accountable for what happened, and for compensation and redress to the affected workers in Mexico.